Thanks for asking me to talk about shoulders today. I'll get rid of my glasses. And um, just basically, you know, all know me. So um, obviously I work at Ashford as well and down at Glenelg. And uh, our rooms, if you have, are down at the bay, that's the rooms there. And, you know, I always like promoting my little podcast series as well. So I'm teaching also at the University of Adelaide. So I'm in charge of the fourth year medical program for in musculoskeletal and, uh, and also director of training at Queen Elizabeth. So, Asked him to talk me about shoulders, and look, my approach to shoulders is pretty straightforward. You've got to try and make a diagnosis before you can work out how to treat a patient, okay? And I know as physios, you learn all about trying to diagnose which particular muscle was in, injured when you examine a sore shoulder. But really, as an orthopedic surgeon, we try and keep it more simple. Um, we usually, I like to use the rule of threes, which I, I think I used all my life. Uh, and actually, I didn't even know what it was until Nicola, my middle daughter, asked me once to check an English essay. I don't know why I checked it, because I didn't even do English in year 12, I did Latin instead. But I was checking this essay, and it came up with this rule of threes, and looked it up, and it's actually a technique that everyone uses, apparently, in real life. You often go up with friends, you go with you know, a group of threes, you, um, you, get, you hear a story about Goldilocks and the three bears, you hear the joke about the three guys that go into the pub, the Australian, English, and Irish. It's, o it's often used as a regular technique of learning things. And the rule of threes is something that we, um, I use to divide things up and teach, keep it simple. It's my surgical sieve. Rather than trying to learn a very complicated surgical sieve, I learn a simple one. And it's really divided up into how, do we, how we actually see, and this thing's point has gone off, the, the, how we actually see things, so whether they present traumatically, electively, or as a mixed picture. And when we go to assess them as orthopedic surgeons or doctors or any of the physios or anything, we actually use a history, examination, and investigations, which is again three different things. And in orthopedics, we talk about our examination being look, feel, and move. And so everything's divided up into threes. And when we go to treat them, we often give them, well, when we investigate, we often try simple things like bloods and then x rays, ultrasounds, and MRIs. Now, I usually say the rule of threes, but what I'm talking about is a group of threes. So if you think three is the most common number, a Gaussian distribution would be two, threes, and fours. So I try and divide things up into groups of twos, threes, and fours. And um, when it comes to treatment, most of the time when you, you, you see my patients after we've offered surgery, when we've done surgery and seen them postoperatively, but before that we might give them time. We'll try the allied health, the physiotherapy, the hand therapists, and, and other therapy that we want to try. And then we'll go to major try injections and then surgery. So it's always a last resort. But really, when people think that shoulders are quite hard to assess, okay, uh, but they're not really. You just got to divide them up into simple things, okay. So if we look at the traumatic things, well, what can be traumatically? How can they present? Well, these are pretty easy. It's a fracture, a dislocation, infections. Well, you may get an acute tendon rupture, which I haven't put on this, but you know that's fairly rare, really. Well, you get electively, and you've got to know the specific conditions that occur: the rotator cuff spectrum. The, the, um, the arthritis and the frozen shoulders, and it could be referred from the neck. Now, people get caught up in thoracic outlets and things like that, or the superior labral tears, and really the superior labral tears are the instability type conditions, which are traumatic initially, but then become elective because of the recurrent, recurrent pain. But the superior labral tears, I'll go into in a minute, it's not that big a deal. It was made a big deal about in the 20, like 2000 when someone decided that it can cause pain, but it's not as common as everyone thinks. So the fractures are pretty easy, um, and we say, what, when I teach the medical students, I say, you know, ask them, well, what could be fractured? And I always tell them, keep it simple, keep the answer. So if I say, what could be fractured? And they start trying to think really hard, and I say, well, the easy answer is the bone. A bone can be fractured. And they say, how many bones can be fractured in the shoulder? How many bones are there? And they say, remembering the rule of threes, and they go, oh, and I say, well, three, isn't there? There's the clavicle, proximal humerus, and scapula. And if you break up the clavicle fracture, then we divide up into medial, mid-shaft, and, and lateral. The mid shaft are the more common ones, the fourth on the push bike. Medial are quite rare, and lateral are common, but they've got a high incidence of non union. They're not as common as the mid shaft, though. Proximal humerus fractured. It can be associated with a dislocation, which makes it more complicated when the tuberosities often pull away. So the tuberosity fracture, which is really a tearing of the rotator cuff, but the actual tuberosities are pulled off the proximal bone. Um, and usually it's associated with a dislocation in an older person, usually. You get a joint surface, it usually occurs with a dislocation again, and you get this, well, that's a big hill sacs where the ball's popped out of joint and it's actually dented the back of the humeral head. Or you can get a surgical neck. Okay. When you get scapular fractures, only a couple of those occur, either the, the, the blade or near the, near the joint surface itself. Going on to the dislocations, well, again, we've talked about the dislocations, um, um, as occur, they can occur in three different areas. How many joints are there in the shoulder? There's three joints, the main glenohumeral joint, 
the AC joint or the sternoclavicular joint. Okay? And all of those can be dislocated. The glenohumeral joints are the most common one. And the people who get dislocations are more likely to get them because of lax ligaments. You can get traumatic ones um, in people who have stiff joints, but that's usually associated with, often with bone fractures at the same time, like the edge of the glenoid can break away. Um, but the people who tend to dislocate are people with lax ligaments, which is why there's a high instance of re-dislocation. And then you can get infection. You know, I, I think of infection as an acute traumatic presentation because people come into casualty, they remember something severe happening to them. And then what can be infected could be any of those areas, the soft tissues around the, around the joints or around the bones. But then we come on to the rotator cuff spectrum. This is really the bulk of what you guys see. You see the people post-surgery for this. But rotator cuff is a, the four muscles that make up the shoulder, that circle the shoulder. You've got supraspinatus, the subscapularis, the teres minor and the infraspinatus. Now, the three, the four muscles are there, but really there's only three that do most of the work. The subscapularis is internal rotation of the shoulder, supraspinatus, initiation of abduction, but really it's a depressor of the humeral head. It actually holds the ball down. If you think of, you think of the acetabulum and the hip, you've got the, the acetabulum comes right over the top, you've got the ball for the, the hip motion. The roof of the acetabulum helps hold the ball in joint. Well, God or nature, whatever you want to believe, has given a very small glenoid, it's only a quarter the size of the humeral head, and then you've got extended the size of the glenoid by putting this labour and the soft tissue thickening around it to actually increase the size. But then the roof of it is really the supraspinatus, which helps hold the ball down in the socket. And when that tears in, in the top of the super subscapularis and infraspinatus on the back and front sides of it, or front and back sides, then the whole humeral head can subluxate. And so when the delta, which is the powerhouse, it's like the Dwayne, Dwayne Johnson, or is it the rock? He's like the powerhouse. The delta is like that. When it goes to move the whole shoulder, if the supraspinatus and the subscap and the infraspinatus, but mainly the supraspinatus is not holding the head down, what happens is the whole humeral head subluxates out of the shoulder joint, which is why you see superior subluxation. And as with any joint, if you get some movements going up and down in it, you get wear, which leads to secondary arthritis. So there's four stages of rotator cuff spectrum. And that is the bursitis, which is if you get the kids to go and paint the whole roof, they'll get an achy shoulder, rest it, put some ice on it, maybe take some anti-inflammatories and it settles down. I do it and I'm buggered for six months because uh, I'm an old bugger and uh, you know, I can barely lift up and whinging to chew about it and stuff. And, and I've got to give it time. I try my exercise to try and build it up and occasionally, eventually I have a steroid injection and will help it settle down. If, I, if I'm getting older again or if I'm smoking, which helps you age quicker too, then the actual tendon can go on to tear and that leads to secondary, that, and that can lead to weakness in the shoulder. Initially, it might, if it's only a small tear, it might just look like a bursitis or tendinopathy, but if it's a big tear, they'll have weakness when you go to test them. And if it leads to secondary arthritis, then I'll get a stiff and painful shoulder all the time. So they're the four stages of the rotator cuff there. And here you can see the superior humeral head subluxing superiorly leading, the humeral head subluxing superiorly leads to arthritis developing. Now, if we look at the arthritis, which is the other things you might see, is that the arthritis go, leads to, if they haven't had improvement with just symptomatology like pain relief, analgesics such as non-steroidals or Panadol, then they might, get, uh, might need to come to surgery. Then we talk about doing a shoulder replacement. But the arthritis can present not just the glenohumeral joint, which is the most common area, but the AC joint, which is why when you get arthritis in the AC joint, you get pain in this area. Uh, right over the AC joint, and that presents not with a painful arc like a rotator cuff spectrum will do, but with pain at the end range of motion. And if you've got pain at the end range of motion, and it's actually made worse if you put the arm across your chest like that, and I'd laugh because when I do it, my own AC joint aches. You put it like that, and you push up against resistance, and you'll get some, an ache just in that area, and that's AC joint pain. And that's often from regular falls or just uh, yeah, push ups are great. Obviously, I haven't been doing that, but um, push ups are a great way of destroying your AC joints as well, or bench presses. And um, obviously falls and knocking it when you're playing footy or any sports as well, and that can lead to AC joint arthritis. And that's, that, in that scenario, can, um, can present with just pain at that site, can be treated with a steroid injection. And if that fails, that's when we do an excision of the lateral endoclavicle. Because the important structures in the, in the actual end of the clavicle is actually the coracoclavicular clavicular ligaments, which hold the coracoid to the clavicle, uh, clavicle which, um, and the AC joint can be excised with impunity, and it, it doesn't actually cause any issues. Can sometimes look to a, if they're very skinny, can look to a cosmetic defect, but it doesn't cause any major problems. The sternoclavicular joint can present with arthritis, but that's actually more common in ladies. 
who um, usually in the 50 year old, they might be putting a necklace on, find a lump there, or, and, or they're getting older and they see this lump and they're worried it's something nasty, and it's just a sternoclavicular arthritis, and it leads to deformity, and it usually can be associated with some pain, but really it's a hard area to treat because you can't really excise the sternoclavicular joint that well, and it doesn't work that well by treating it. So it's just a presents with usually a painless lump or sometimes a painful lump. Well, glenohumeral joint arthritis is the most common one. Well, actually, AC joint is probably more common actually overall, but glenohumeral joint is the one you'll see in the, in the hospital. And with either primary arthritis, where the joint just wears out, and see how this line, if you follow that up, is this one smoother line. While here, the humeral head subluxate laid out, this is the rotator cuff arthritis. We'll come to that in a sec. Then our last, present, well, last couple of presentations, frozen shoulder, you don't get to see as much of that, but that's that awful condition. It's associated with diabetes or a stressful diagnosis, either tra a major trauma, or they've had, a, um, they've had a heart attack, or they've had diagnosis of breast cancer, or the treatment associated with that can lead to a frozen shoulder. The most common one's probably diabetes. It's a self-limiting condition. No one knows why it occurs. It's bloody awful because people are in pain. I see the patients in the clinic when they come through and they, they, look, they look tired, they're teary. It's awful. You just feel like you just want to give them a hug. They look so upset, you know. And when they get start, when the, it goes through this funny phase of, I, I drew this on a Saturday afternoon one day, I think Jill was working. I, I did this, decided to do this, this graph. It took me the whole afternoon and no one ever, <laughs> no one ever understands the bloody thing. Um, but, um, but it's actually, what is this, the patient's normal, got no problems at all. And actually, for someone who always divides things up into threes, I always like, and the frozen shoulders normally classically divide up into threes. I think of it as in fours. So it's actually quite unusual that way because I go away from the convention for that one. <laughs> um, but um, they, they've got no pain and they've got full, they've got full movement. Then they get awful pain. And at that stage, they look like a bursitis. It's awful pain, it's searing. And then they get stiffness. And then the pain goes away. And then the stiffness goes away. And by the stage, the, the time the pain starts improving, they're happy. They've got a bloody stiff shoulder, but they're feeling better because the pain's disappearing. And the funny thing with frozen shoulder, the longer you wait to do anything for it, the better it does. So if you rush in and operate or do a manipulation or anything or injection, it doesn't do as well as if you wait until they're getting the latter stages when it's settling down. And that's when they do better. And usually by that stage, they don't want any treatment because the pain's settling down. So. But the, the treatment for it is wait, give it time. Try, some people don't like physio because they say it makes it worse. I usually try it if they can tolerate it to try and maintain motion. Um, and you can try steroid injection into the joint. But um, eventually with time it will improve. The injection might help speed up the recovery. And occasionally, um, and often it's usually done because you're not sure of the diagnosis, so, but occasionally they come to surgery where at the time you might do a capsular release to help encourage motion. But those patients, you've really got to push the movement as much as possible, even more important than the average decompression, so they don't stiffen up again. And then we've got our instability patterns. So these ones are pretty easy to diagnose because someone says, my shoulder popped out of joint, <laughs> or they feel like it's popping out of joint. Now, when we go to assess them, um, people worry about O'Brien's test and all these sort of tests to try and assess them. But really, it's really, it's, and the shoulder's popping out of joint with an x-ray showing it, it's pretty easy. And the real subtle instability is really hard to diagnose. You know, people can try and say they can feel it moving and stuff, but really it's more based on the history and then further investigations with an MRI scan, usually in my hand. So I don't put a lot of emphasis on the O'Brien's test. Um, but really they present with an instability episode. What usually happens is, you've got this, this is the labrum around the socket. When they dislocate the ball out of the socket, the whole labrum peels away from it, and it's basically, it never heals back in the correct position. So it's a bit like, um, yeah, the other day when Jill's special soup bowl was uh, sitting there and uh, I accidentally broke the lip off it and um, I went to glue it back together and this is a make it's a makeup story. But 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 if I did if I left the soup bowl sitting there and she had a soccer ball balancing it normally, it'd be fine. But when I when the lip broke off it and I tried to put it back together, it left a gap, the soccer ball wanted to fall forward in the soup bowl, right? If I glue it back together, but I don't batch it up properly because I've had a few drinks when I'm gluing it, and, um, and I put the, uh, put the lip immediately in that position, when you put the soccer ball in it, it's going to want to try and fall out the front. So when a labrum pulls away, it either doesn't heal back properly, which means the whole shoulder wants to fall forward, or it heals back immediately, and that's called an Alps lesion, anterior, anterior lateral periosteal sleeve avulsion. Um, and um, that's, uh, if it heals immediately, then the whole ball wants to sit forward. So, most people would say the, a, dis, a first time dislocation for most people in, a, in, the under eight, in the under 35 year old age group, active sports person, is considered like an ACL tear. Okay? It's, there's a high indication 
for going in and primary stabilising them because there's a high chance they're going to re-desiccate. And that if you stabilise them either with an arthroscopic or, an op or a ladder J procedure or an open approach, then it reduces it from an 85% re re-desiccation rate down to 10 to 15%, or even better if you do a ladder J, um, which I'll go through in a sec. So, but with the um, superior label tears, that's a funny one, okay? Everyone gets obsessed about these superior label tears because they've got this pain. Often, quite a story I'll get is a physio will see them outside and say, I've got this painful shoulder. It hasn't got better with uh, all the exercises I've done, so it can't be rotator cuff because it would have got better normally, and, um, which is not always the case because obviously the, I wouldn't operate on them if they didn't, if they all got better with physio. Um, and they said, it must be a, a superior labral revulsion, a slap tear. And that's because the biceps comes up and attaches to the top of the labrum and it's a, this idea of pulling it pulling away. And yeah, look, those label tears do occur, but most label tears you see incidentally or slap tears are just ageing. It's just a degeneration of the labrum peeling away from the, of the bone. And we know that because a lot of those, <coughs> those label tears we used to repair probably didn't make a big difference to the outcome on their, whether they got better or not. Some of them do. You know, if you've got a classic one, they get better, but not all of them. And um, often they're just incidental findings. So, and... And therefore, the actual repairing of superior labrums have probably gone out the window a bit. And a lot of surgeons will actually, instead of repairing the superior labrum, just take the, the biceps off the labrum and either release it, called a tenotomy, or reattach it outside the shoulder into the proximal bone so it maintains the shape of the, of the biceps, um, which is called a tenodesis. Okay, and you've seen patients that have that. Of course, if you attach it here, then you're putting ten the biceps under tension, which is why you don't want to stretch it out as much because you'd be pulling on the attachment when you've attached it proximally. To my mind, I, I have the debate with the registrars all the time about this because I actually don't think it matters what you do to the biceps. You either release it or, um, or, or do a label tear or do a tenodesis. They probably end up with the same sort of outcomes, but there's plus and minuses depending on who, who you ask and everyone's got different ways that they like to do it. So if you divide it up, it really all just comes down to this. Remembering to exclude the cervical spine at the start. So that's all, that's all that occurs on the shoulder. So people say, hey, you're doing shoulders, it's really, really hard. And I often give the example of, of a hip. If you divide hips into the same scenario, the traumatic elective and, and infections, traumatic uh, infection problems, fracture dislocation and infections, or elective, if you do the same scenario for hip, your hip actually, the main diagnosis is hip arthritis or things that cause arthritis, such as slip capital femoral epiphysis or Perthes disease or CDH or femoral acid impingement. The second thing that occurs in the hip is referred pain from the back, and then you get bursitis. There's only three diagnoses, of which only one's, trauma, one's you know, elective type of thing. So the hip surgeons really have only got one diagnosis to make, and it's arthritis. Um, shoulders, we've only got four diagnoses to make. It's not that hard. I know in the clinics and physios, I say, oh, I think this muscle's playing up, and this, and it, it really, I don't know if it makes it too, you're trying to complicate it too hard. It's a bit like, um, trying to think too much into exactly which pen you use for the exam. It doesn't really matter as long as you get the writing down. And the same with wondering if you think it's a muscular type of thing or it's bursitis or whatever it is, you're going to still try treating them with the physio, the standard techniques of anti-inflammatory measures, exercise regime and giving it time anyway. So really whether it matters which exact diagnosis, I'm not sure it does. So, so when I came to see a patient, and in fact, uh, when I assess a patient, this is all I need really to assess a patient. It sounds really hard, but you get an older patient's more likely to have arthritis, a middle aged person's got a stiff shoulder, frozen shoulder, and a young person, bursitis or tendinopathy. When I go to assess them, all I do is check the neck motion first of all and see if they've got a positive Sperling's test, and if that reproduces pain down the arm, I'm thinking, and it's got pain, if they're pain, they say it's in the neck, in the shoulder, but it's actually the neck and medial scapula, I'm thinking it's neck. If I go to, if they've got pain more anterior, I'm thinking more glenohumeral hemorrhoid joint, and laterally I'm thinking more rotator cuff problems, okay? Um, when I, go, I check the neck out first of all, then I actually look at them and see, see if there's any deformity or any wasting. I then feel and see where the most tender are the AC joint, the subacromial space, anterior shoulder, or posteriorly to some degree, okay? Then I might move them. I do, or I, the main movements are forward flexion and adduction, looking for range of motion and external rotation, okay? So if they hitch, and they're going to get up to there and up to there, I'm thinking it's a stiff shoulder. And when I'm doing it, I'll probably put my hand on their shoulder feeling for crepitus. If it's soft tissue crepitus, I'm thinking cuff tears. Bony crepitus, I'm thinking arthritis. If, they, if they, they can't get up there, I'll then do it a second time passively, putting my hand on the scapula, see if the whole scapula moves with it. And, yeah, and also, the great way is external rotation. If they've got no external rotation actively or passively, and they're hitching forward and flexion and abduction actively and passively, it means the whole shoulder's not moving. And of those previous diagnoses, there's only really um, two 
and they can cause a stiff shoulder, and that's a frozen shoulder or osteoarthritis. Okay, and if they depending on and depending on their age, we'll help you make the diagnosis. Depending on whether there's bony crepitus, we'll help you. But also, an X-ray is the easiest thing. If they've got full range of motion, act passively, but only limited active motion, then I'm thinking the muscles aren't supplying the movement, and then I'm thinking either a massive rotator cuff tear or a cervical nerve root entrapment. And if they've got full movement actively and passively, we've got a pain for a lark, then I'm thinking either bursitis or rotator cuff tears, a small rotator cuff tear. And if they've got full range of motion but end range of motion, I'm thinking AC joint arthritis, okay, with cross -arm, and I can test cross arm adduction. Now I can test muscle power to see if the tendons are working fine to test if there's a rotator cuff tear. And there's a few other specific tests, like the test for impingement, it's a Hawkins sign to see if they catch when certain movements. Or the cross arm adduction test to see when I put it in that position to see if it's painful for the AC joint. But really that's all you need. So it's not that hard to assess them. And the ones that aren't, sometimes you need to reassess. I mean in medicine and in any areas we play who wants to be a millionaire all the time. Um, we get to ask the audience, as we ask a group of people what they think. We get to invite them back the next day to continue on. That's when we say, look, this is really difficult. We need to bring it back and, uh, and to give you more time towards it, in which case you quickly look up all your books and reassess people, ask the audience and all things. Or you get to phone a friend, you get a consult, which is why I give my phone number to all the GPs and everyone to say, ring me any time. So that's really how I assess them. It's just that flow diagram like that. And it's basically what I've just said a minute ago. So when, it, when we go to treat them though, you try simple things first of all. You give it time, you try the physio with the TheraBand exercises. And it's a surprising number of people who try the dry needling. I, I think it's okay for the anti-inflammatory part, but I really think it's not a lot to roll, not big role for. I think it's really just active exercises. Um, and you might try a steroid injection under ultrasound guidance nowadays is what we tend to go for. Um, but we, we sometimes we come to the theatre though. So, this is actually yesterday because I forgot to take a photo. <laughs> so, um, so that's me in theatre. This is how we set up in the patient. I do it in a lateral position. So the patient's in traction. You can see their arms up here. In, and this is the arm. Um, and they've got the scope in the shoulder from the back and coming from the side. The good thing about it is like playing a video game. So it's, you have to be good at doing changing hands and doing both one hand and the other. So that's quite good fun. But we've got these instruments which are down here. And these are the devices we use to pass the... That's, that's a pen to give you an idea. The device we use to pass the sutures through the cuff, the, the cannulas, uh, our ablation unit to help to clear away the soft tissue from the bone, a little burr, which is just down there, and that burrs away the bone, or the anchor. You can have a play with that later if you wish. We go on. This is what we're trying to do here is a, uh, we're trying to shave any hooked bone to make it nice and flat. And or if there's an AC joint, we want to excise the end of the collarbone to make a nice little gap there so it doesn't rub against it. If we have a look, um, let's see, see if this works. So here we are. Here's the, this is inside the shoulder. This is an old video, so it's not really quite as good a quality. But you'll see, here's the labrum, it's torn away, it's just degenerate. Here's the biceps tendon, and here's the humeral head and the glenoid. I've got to orientate as if they're lying, lying on this side, because they are lying on this side for this one. Um, there's, there's the cannula coming from the front, and there's the ablation unit, which is that little unit there. We use this to clear away any soft tissue. Probably having a bit of fun doing this one, probably. Um, you watch it back and it goes, come on, it's not the next part. But <laughs> and um, so that's it clearing away, or eventually clear away, you'll see the subscapularis tendon sitting in around about here in a sec. So this looks really big, but you'll see it's, only, it's a lot smaller than the size of the pen. It's about three or four millimetres in diameter. I might get I'll fast forward a bit. Oh, there's the subscap just there. Oh, here we are. So that, that's a glenoid. Look from another view, you can see. See here, the glenoid is small compared to the size of the ball. See how big the ball is? I'm looking from the front here. It's ridiculous. No wonder they dislocate. Okay. So, and there's the probe filling to probe the edge of the labrum. Even though it was a bit frayed, it was actually quite stable. And this one here, you can see this is the bursa. Now, when you first get into the, the bursa, you can't see a bloody thing. So, you've got to clear away the bursa. So, you're doing a lot of this by feel initially just to expose the bone. And here's the bone coming into view here. So, we're using a combination of the diathermy device, which at the moment is just it gives you an example of how tricky it is at the start. Um, 
because it's right in front of your face. It's like driving in fog. Um, but we haven't made. But I'm using, that's why you need to triangulate. So using your, you know where your end of the instruments are because of your feel of the instruments and the size. And eventually you get the bone, that's the bone there, and that's the edge of the chromium. And we'll clear it away, we're clearing away a bit more. I'm just cutting. And you'll see the AC joint appearing in that as well. And so the bone is exposed. So I'm actually feeling that at the same time, which makes it a lot easier for me. Um, and as I say, this is an old video, so I'm probably get better quality video for the future. The one yesterday was really, I, I saved it, but it was so fluffy and so even harder than this to see. I thought it wouldn't make me very good for you. Then you use this soft tissue device, to, it's like a vacuum cleaner, which sucks this bursa up into it and it burrs it away and tromps it up. And yeah, so we hold that away from the rotator cuff to clear away the bursa there. So you can, it's really more so you can see what, you can do, what you're doing. And that's the inflamed bursa. The new bursa will form and then we're back to see the bone, and then we start shaving the bone away. So we use this, it looks massive, it's only, uh, I think it's four millimetres in diameter, it will come through eventually. Um, come on. Um, so this is a, a subacromial yeah. decompression. Yeah, this is a subacromial decompression. Yeah, that's right. Here we are. Here's our burr. So this is a burr we use, it's like a high speed, it's 8,000 revs a minute, and it's it die, die, uh, spins around and chomps up the bone to shave it away. So you want it fast, so it actually you can use it smoothly. So you've got to hold your hand really loose and let it, just, it do it work. You just glide it across the bone. Now the patient, in, I don't know if you noticed, but the patient's actually orientated, if he's standing up in this situation, this is why I like orientating it. So this is superior, humeral head's down here. I'm coming from the lateral side to clear away that area there. Then I'll put the, the telescope in from here to look from the back and then use this straight device as a guide to work out how much bone to shave away. So that's it. The bursa falls away out. Well, the bursa goes for miles. It's, well, not miles, but you know, <laughs> about 15 centimetres right down laterally. You take the part away where it's underneath your chromium enough to, to actually clear as much of it away as possible. And so. how long does it take to um, repair? How long? Well, all soft tissue and everything takes about three or four months to really recover, right. which is why. Um, Shoulders take sl a slower recovery than, say, a knee replacement where you're just replacing the bone. Mm -hmm. Here, we're coming. Just form a, new form a new bursa. But that's why, if we're repairing the tendon, which we'll show in a minute, you roughen up the bone and tie the tendon down to the bone so it sticks. And here, we've shaved away the bone, um, to, to take away the spur, and we've roughened up the tendon because we've taken away the bursa. If we leave it still, it will stick. So that's why I'm so keen on getting it moving straight away. Mm -hmm. no. So here we're coming from the back now. I've changed portals. I'm actually using the other hand now to shave from the back. I'm holding the scope with my right hand in this one and shaving this tissue away here. With the idea of um, getting this nice and flat like that. And have you just retracted the tendon? No, the tendon's underneath it, so we've got the traction on. Some people do it in a beach chair positioning, which needs, often they need a special device for that. A beach chair means they sit up slightly. They're actually supine sitting up as opposed to being on their side lying with arm in traction. There's plus or minuses for both. So. You just have a machine that pulls their arm. I just put a, yeah, just put a string in a body, a weight. Yeah. In Dung Freeze, we didn't have the proper pulley system, so we'd put it over a, a, a drip stand. And eventually got the pulley system because we kept on bending the drip stands, so <laughs> eventually they just bought us a proper traction device. <laughs> so that was a long time ago. Um, so that's it shaved away. So we'll move on. Um, so this is what we're trying to do, is we're trying to shave away a spur. This is looking from the side on our left shoulder, I think. And we're shaving that spur away so it's nice and flat. This instrument's now nice and flat against it. And you can see small tears here. This is a small one. The small tears, they can get a bit of a frozen shoulder afterwards. That's why I get them moving earlier, at four weeks. They still take six weeks to properly heal, but if you get them, keep them six weeks, they might get too stiff. So you put a little anchor here and tie it down. This small tear in an open approach, you might not have worried about it because it's only probably about five millimetres in the size, but here it's easily repaired. When you get big tears, and this one, I'll just get this one going. This is... So you've actually, you've repaired the small tear, but you want us to mobilise the area. Uh, well, you still do the same things, but I get them out of the thing at four weeks. Here's a, here's a big tear. This is the grade tube rossi. This patient's stand, this is the tear here. I've roughened up the bone. You put in an anchor, which is, this one's a metal anchor screws into the bone. We then, um, so that's only four or five millimetres in the size. Yeah. 
That's the, we retrieve the suture, we then pass it through the tendon using this device. This is all, all through keyhole, of course. Yeah. And then pass it through that way. Then I grab a grasper, which grabs the suture and just retrieves it. So it's just like putting the anchor in and passing it this open it all telescopically. And so it's quite good fun. And the really weird thing about me is that I've done the operation about you know, millions of times, well not millions, but, and um, I've watched this video heaps of times, I still watch it every time. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's not like, I know it off my heart, but I still watch it, going, oh, it's cool. Um, <laughs> so, so I put the, um, I put the uh, sutures in through the tendons, and so these are like mattress sutures, so those numbers are two going through together to bring it across. And this guy I put in a, um, this guy was actually in his 70s actually, and um, put a second anchor in. Probably, probably could have gone away without this second anchor, but I thought because of his age, I put in another one just for some extra support. And I think this might have been a bigger thread, this one. Um, so I put a second anchor in. I put in three mattress sutures in this guy, I think. So there's a, another suture going across there, and we're going to grab, so we've got this whole row of sutures across here. And this one will be coming out through a different portal so I don't get them mixed up, otherwise the purples can get mixed up. So I've got the different, another hole here, that's why some of them have a fifth hole. Um, so and then we retrieve the suture, and what amazes me, see previously the tear was here, I just pull it on that one suture, one knot, and look it's just going to repair the tendon straight off, you know. This, this one suture brings it back together, this amazes me. And this is a sliding knot, so it's like a little, um, it's like a noose, it's a slip knot that comes down and tightens. It's called a SMC, this particular knot type variety, because it stands for Samsung Medical Center, um, Korean knot. So we retrieve all the sutures. You can see, you can't even see the tear anymore. But if you tie it down on the inside, then the out outer side is going to stick up a little bit. So eventually, I'm going to bring them across the top to help compress the outside. And that's called a double row. So there's another sutures going in. Yeah, yeah, just so you can keep track of which one's which, because two are, there's one purple, one blue and white one in each anchor, so that's just a particular brand, it depends which brand you use, so. See, it looks like a bit of a mess initially, and it comes down to a little knot. And then you put in a lateral anchor, just here, and this one's going to grab those sutures just there to bring it down. And we just compress that. So it so basically tries to compress that dog ear sort of down to make it nice and flush. And we put that in. So make a hole this one. This one goes down and secures it. And uh, and then they're, let's looking from the side, see how it's like the anchors, are, the sutures are coming across the top. And that's it there. It's a cover of it. So. Yeah, that's probably just a medium-sized one, actually. But yeah, that's six weeks. Yeah, so six anything, weeks. anything rather than a small pinprick one. So honest. Which you would document. Yeah. That you wanted to get going in four weeks. Yeah. Now that's that's right. Yeah, that's why I put down. Antinodesis. What would you? Antinod for biceps tenodesis. Yeah. If it's just that pu purely that, purely that, then I would just avoid getting full extension on the elbow to take the stress off the proximal biceps part. Yeah. I, when I do tenodesis, often I do it. So a lot of people put a hold in the bone and shove the bone into that, and that's a good open approach. And some people do it through a little small mini approach, which is a nice way of doing it. It's probably got the best fixation. But I like to do, if I do a tendus, is to try and grab it and tie it up where I'm repairing the, the cup as well, and that top part. And that I've done all through the telescope. So you would avoid full extension for how long? Uh, you should try and six, six weeks or so. But everyone's got their own little... Just extend actively as far as they... I would... I would go just enough for function to get themselves dressed, yeah. but not to do too much. I wouldn't get them doing heavy lifting, and I would still I'd try and avoid going out straight. I'd probably try, try and keep it at 90 degrees if I can, but to get dressed a bit, they have to get straighten their arm a little bit. Yeah. yeah. It's like those, sling, those slings that have their arms out like this, yeah. the abduction slings. Yeah. They've been shown that's better for a, la a labor repair, but to me, the moment you get dressed, you put your arm down there, and the moment you go to sleep, it falls that way, and so really it's doing nothing, really. And, um, I think it's, I don't use them because I think it's a waste of money because it's actually almost impossible to, you know, you put, take it off and you get yourself dressed, how it's going to fall over. So mm -hmm. I think you, you can't really rely on those that much. I think the old Peter Sellers, you know, plaster with a big, you know, um, room stick in the armpit, that probably would work really well, but that, you don't see too many of those around Adelaide. So. so will your 
the document with your your utilities before yeah. the Yeah. I'd say avoid avoid just avoid the yeah. extension. Yeah. 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 If I if I, if I forget to, that's what I'd want to do. Yeah. 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 For light activities, obviously yeah. you would be heavy lifting anyway. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Move on to the shoulder replacements. These are the types of shoulder replacements. Yeah. So this one's a standard one where you put the socket here and the ball here. And this one's a back to front one. And these are the reverses. Okay. So you see, see this is primary arthritis. And that's where you do a standard shoulder replacement with the ball and the socket. There's that little white dot there. And a reverse one is when the humeral head's superior subluxated because the rotator cuff's torn. And you put the ball where the socket goes and the socket where the ball is. So you look at it and you don't initially notice it until you actually take it on. The reason we do that is because we read the instructions wrong, and um, <laughs> so you know that it was designed back in the 1990s, I think. And I remember in about 2001, I was at a meeting of someone talking about a delta, and I didn't even know, you know, didn't even know what they were talking about at the time. And there's a book I've got on shoulders. I threw it out the other day because it had everything. It was a great shoulders book, but didn't even mention reverses, shoulder replacements, and reverses is probably the, one of the main things we do nowadays. They're really, they're actually it's been like a gift from God. They actually. Fantastic for fractures. I'm doing one tomorrow for a fracture at Queen Elizabeth. We've got there fantastic for rotator cuff tears. And these patients previously would really struggle. And the results, I, I think a lot of us were pretty held back on thinking maybe they might play up because it doesn't make a lot of sense. And the results are looking, if not, you know, looking at least as good as, well, looking close to hip and knee replacement type results. So at 10 years. So it's pretty cool. Shoulder dislocation. So when we repair a shoulder, um, you tie the labrum down to the edge of the glenoid. Okay, that's how we do an arthroscopic. We do that same with the same technique if before when we were doing the, a, um, the decompression, you saw the glenoid and the labrum. What we'd do there is we'd actually make holes in the bone, put in anchors and tie the tissue down to the, the bone, just like that. A more common, well not more common, actually a, a very popular thing at the moment, that's not more common, um, is a ladder J where you take the edge of the coracoid off and stick it here. So that increases the size of the bone. This is for, this actually, I didn't treat him, and I've heard here say, so it may not be true, but um, I heard that, well, I probably won't say his name for the recording, but one of the famous uh, Geelong footy players who kept dislocating his shoulder after the stabilisation ended up uh, having the latter J done um, and did really well from it. So from then on, nearly every AFL player wanted a latter J. Um, and uh, so I've done a, a fair few of them. You know, it's not as common as an arthroscopic stabilisation, but they're a nice little operation. And what happens is when they see how the conjoint tendon, which is the short headed biceps and the coracobrachialis is just there, when they bring their arm into that position, that cuts the corner and also acts as a sling to help hold the shoulder and joint as well. So, so that's why they're popular. And you can see here the bit of bone just sitting there and the two screws going across. And they're, they're very stable. I'd still treat them the same way. I think you can get caught up in trying to work out, oh, you know, this one, you've got to move this part and this, you know, you can move it four and a half weeks, but then at four weeks and nine days, you have to eat a, eat a sandwich with your left hand or something. You know, you can get caught up trying to make it too tricky. Um, so I just try and keep it simple, just because it's, it's, the more complicated you make it, the less likely they're going to follow the, the treatment. So. But, you know, things are coming on. They're going to, you know, it's amazing what's happening nowadays. So if we look here, this is, I'll get this going. We actually, I didn't bring it out actually. Um, this is what's now available. Uh, we have in our office. It's a little portable ultrasound machine that hooks up to the iPad. So we can ultrasound shoulders or hands and things. I don't try and do it as like, a, I'm not trying to be Jones and Partners or anything like that, or Radiology SA, but it can give feedback to the patients. You guys have probably already seen them in physio practices, but they're getting so small. And it's amazing, you can see on this, uh, with that player, I think I just had it going a minute ago. That's, a, uh, that's my flexor tendon moving in, over my metacarpal head. I can show for trigger fingers on patients. What we can do, shoulders, and that's the subscapularis and the biceps tendon appearing there. And it's amazing how good these, the quality of these things are. And I think in the future, the re a really, really, in fact, I'll probably be retired when the time comes in really properly, but augmented reality glasses, where they'll have like the Apple glasses or Google glasses and they'll be able to have heads up display while we're operating instead of having to look up at TV screens. I think it's gonna be fantastic. So I think the guys got training now, they've got a lot of, a lot of excitement coming their way. And finally, um, I'll put that down. 
Yeah, you're plugged to my podcast series. <laughs> <laughs> so um, that's what I've been doing in COVID. When, it, in, when COVID hit in April, when everyone just doing private stopped working and grew beards and stuff, I don't know why they all had beards because they had all the time in the world to shave. If anything, they should grow beards when they're really busy and then shave all the time when they're not working. But during that time, I was putting everything online with another colleague for the university, and I thought, what the heck, let's set up a podcast as well as if my life's not complicated enough. And um, so we've got 24 episodes now, so, and um, it's just more the idea of a bit of chit chat. So a lot, not just orthopedic, so, in different areas, so. So, so I've, you know, I've interviewed a chronic pain specialist just recently, and we did the, in fact, we interviewed the Taboo, the Young Australian of the Year, and her, her friend, who's the tour in Eloise Hall, and um, Isabel Marshall the other day as well. So, so some, just some interesting topics, so. So that's basically it. So time for questions, I reckon. So it's not shoulders are a piece of cake. <laughs> shoulders are a piece of cake. It's just a matter of making the diagnosis and then trying to train the non the non operative approach first and giving it time. And if not better, then we've got we've got lots of things. So for frozen shoulders. They're the ones that are the hardest because they're the people that want to be treated straight away and you can understand why they're sore, but they're the ones you have to try and reassure and go as long as possible. But the others, most bursitis is people present with um, a painful arc. You give it time and try the TheraBand exercises and try a steroid so injection. TheraBand is internal and external tissue exercises? Yeah, yes. Yeah, for, so. for the bursitis? Yeah, yeah. So I've got one in my office on the door. So when time my patient wants to show it, I show them the exercise, I just do another 12 myself because it makes me do my own ones. So, so I go, there you go, and I'll stand there keeping doing them. And I go, yeah, I've known now, and I go, no, I've got to do another five first, hang on. And um, so, so that's simple exercises. Um, injections. That would be for bursitis. And, and for, um, so for bursitis or rotator cuff tears, okay. Yeah. If there's a, yeah, it's small. even for you know, even for big tears, the question that everyone was asked is, what about a big tear? Say, um, let's say, um, well, I okay, I fall over in the street and I've hurt my shoulder, and I, I go along and I get an ultrasound that says there's a tear in my rotator cuff. Okay, well, because I'm over 50, there's a reasonable chance that tear was developing anywhere or was already there. So what you do is try and try and give it time, try an injection, and try some exercise and see how it goes. Now, if it settles down completely, because I'm you might say 55 is a bit younger as well. You might follow it up with another ultrasound or to see how they're going down the track. But you know, usually if it go, pain goes away, then it's fine. Just because I've got arthritis in my neck doesn't mean I need to have a neck fusion. And just because I've got some arthritis in my knee doesn't mean I need a knee replacement. You only need a knee replacement or neck fusion if you're having a lot of pain with these things and not setting all the other measures. And the same thing happens with the rotator cuff. Okay. If, however, I come on 30 years of age and come off my motorbike and rip the whole tendon off the, off the bone, that's a different story, that's an acute repair. But most, fro most rotator cuff tears, you try some simple measures first. But if there was a massive tear, you might say, well, at 55, it's massive already, and it's probably repairable. Maybe it might push you to repairing it early. But most of them are only smallish type tears anyway. And they just, just be able to use their arm compensating with? Yeah, the, the, other, the other muscles will, that's what the whole idea of infraspinatus and teres minor and subscap exercises are to help do the job for it, yeah. Because what, what you can't say is that a rotator cuff tear will never re-tear after repair, because it probably will at some stage. What about dislocations? When do you go in and do a so, repair for that? So a first time dislocation in under 35 years of age, if you don't repair it, could go on to lead to arthritis. So there's just as big indication for doing a repair for that than there is for doing an ACL tear. The, pro the problem with, the thing is with shoulders, and we all do it, all the shoulder surgeons do it too, is that, um, you know, a knee, you have a sore knee, and if it's been sore for three or four weeks, and no one you know, thinks twice about having an arthroscopy, or the rupture of the cruciate, no one thinks twice about having a stabilisation. Yet for a shoulder, they've got a, a cuff tear, they had a dislocation in a young person, they go, oh, do you really think we need to do it? And you do a cuff tear, and someone's not getting better, and they say, oh, we've had three injections, maybe we'll try another one, we'll try another, five weeks of, you know, five months of physiotherapy, you know, you can try the simple things, but if they're not selling, that's when surgery is a good option for them, or at least worth considering about it. So, so, so there's a happy medium between going the day after an injury and waiting three years or so. So I think there's certainly, there's a good argument for waiting even time, and I always try and do that for everyone, because uh, that way I feel happy in myself, I've done what I would do, I'd like to treat people, I'd like to be treated 
I'd like to treat people like I'd like to be treated myself. But um, certainly there was some, like if it was a 40 year old guy with a big tear in his rotator cuff, I'd probably be more inclined to go in early. A 75 year old person definitely always try heaps of physio first. But either way, both are, both are good indications for non-operative or conservative management. But you go for both. You can sort of, you know, you take each case on its merits. And with the rotator Yeah, it's plastic. Okay. So um, this is it here. This is one. I think it's been caught or in something. So you can actually. Well, that one has been cut, but you try and tear that. Um, that's the anchor. That's a plastic version. Anchor. That's one to play with there. Okay. If you try and pull on it, you'll find uh, I, I, it doesn't actually cut into the gloves. But actually, when I'm tying the knots, it actually bends around the gloves. So I, all all the shoulder surgeons will have like little always have permanent cuts in our hands from tying the knots because actually. It's surprised you think your callus is there, but you don't, and that sort of Does it have a certain lifespan, like, like joint replacements, or does it...? Um, well, it only needs to last six or eight weeks while the tendon heals to the oh, bone. Yeah. So, but I think there's about a... I think they can... They do eventually deteriorate, okay. so, yeah. I think it's like a six-month wait or so, so... Yeah. Have you but ever the, had them just pull straight through? You think you've got a good hold and it just roots through? Yeah, well, that's... There'll be ones that... Usually you won't worry about the bone being soft um, and the, the anchor pulling out of the bone. But um, yeah, you can get the tendons ripping through it too. That's usually those patients are ones where there'll be an older patient with poor quality of tendons. It's not trying to stitch. It's not trying to stitch. Yeah. yeah, but you know, you might. It looked a lot bigger, didn't it? Yeah. 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 Well, they're actually basically the same sort of technology. Yeah. The plaster, like, so. Yeah. 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 All right. Yeah, it's like these. All these. This is the burr. This is the high-speed burr, and that's how big that is. So yeah, my pen's bigger than that. So, and that's the. And uh, this is a different brand of. Um, I'll just stand in front of the camera too. But this is a different brand of the suture passer. But that one's the how it passes through. So, this disposable one. Yeah. So you can play with any of these things. So, passing around. So, don't put your finger in it because it'll hurt you. <laughs> so. Oh wow! Thank you. Thank wow, you excellent, much. excellent refreshments, yeah. refreshments. Oh look, it's a glass, it's a bottle of water. <laughs>